You are listening to Where is the Line? The stories you will hear will be depraved, disturbing, and true. If you are easily unsettled, you may find this program offensive. And if you are under the age of 18, fuck off. Everybody drinking blood, everybody eating brains Some monster party Everybody eating flesh, everybody breaking bones Some monster party Thank you for listening to episode 9 of Where is the Line? With me today, again, for the second time, is my friend Samantha Say something disturbing, Samantha. Yellow fluid. Yellow fluid. Yeah. When you hear the phrase yellow fluid, honk your horn. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if anybody has ever actually honked their horn. Probably not. A lot's been going on. I got my pins taken out. Uh, if you'd like to see me having what looks like a terribly painful medical procedure done, I, I did film it and it's on our Facebook page. You watched it, right? Yes, I had a great laugh. (laughs) (laughs) You had a great laugh at this incredibly painful experience that I had. Yes, I'm Uh, sorry. That's okay. You took it like a champ, though. (laughs) Also, have you seen the comments below the last episode, the um, Shannon Larratt episode, which had a lot to do with bisected penises and things? Have you seen the comment section on that? It got pretty weird. It did. It got, it took a strange turn where people started posting cute pictures of their animals. I noticed that too, and I was like, what's (laughs) happening? And I felt like people were having to decompress from that episode. Maybe it was. Yeah. Maybe it was was kind of a decompression tactic. It was very cathartic for everyone. So you ready to get into this episode? Oh, yeah. Let's do it. In December 1976, while working on the set of The Six Million Dollar Man, a Universal Studios employee named Chris Haynes along with his crew, were at a California funhouse preparing it for an on-location shoot for the show. At some point during the preparation, they see a mannequin covered in what appears to be glow-in-the-dark paint. It seems that they might have thought that the mannequin looked too fake to be used as a prop in the show. So Haynes starts futzing with it to get it down, and the arm falls off. So Haynes picks up the arm, notices that the interior had a, quote, beef jerky texture to it. Then he notices in the middle of this beef jerky what looks like a bone. Haynes reached out and moved the remaining hand back just a little bit and noticed that this mannequin happened to be anatomically correct, complete with a small wisp of pubic hair. In case you haven't figured it out yet, this is not a mannequin. It is, as it eventually turns out, the mummified corpse of a turn-of-the-century outlaw named Elmer McCurdy. So who was Elmer McCurdy and how did he turn up on the set of The Six Million Dollar Man? That's what we're talking about today. The bumbling life and morbidly outrageous post-death experiences of Elmer McCurdy. Elmer was born in Washington, Maine. He was the son of Augusta Sadie McCurdy. This was an illegitimate birth and no one really knows who his father was, but it is speculated that more than likely his real father was Sadie's cousin, okay? And that was a big no-no, even then. Yeah, I mean, it's still frowned upon now. <laughs> even in Alabama. Yeah. Oh, did you see that story about those people who drove from Utah to Colorado, their first cousins, so they could get married? Colorado, it's okay to marry your first cousin. This just happened last week. Hmm. They drove from Utah to marry their I think first Game cousin. of Thrones says... Uh, Made it incest a little more palatable for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean... Cersei and Jamie, I don't have a problem with them. Me neither. It's totally hot. Yeah, it is. I uh, okay, so after Sadie McCurdy had Elmer, people speculated that the unknown father was really her first cousin, Charles Smith. And what's interesting is later on in life, Elmer McCurdy used Charles Smith as an alias. Oh, he did? Yeah. I did come across that. I didn't, okay. I didn't realize the significance of that when I saw it, though. Uh-huh. That's his possible 
Uncle Daddy. Now, because of the shame that was brought to Sadie over this illegitimate birth, her brother, George, and his wife, Helen, adopted Elmer as their own. And Sadie lived with them, too. But it was like it was George and Helen's son. Now, George, Elmer's adopted father and real uncle, died of tuberculosis in 1890. So then Sadie and Helen uh, moved with Elmer to Bangor, Maine. Now, at this point, Elmer is growing up. He's getting to be a teenager. And that's when Sadie decided to reveal to him that she was, in fact, his real mother. And, of course, like what happens to many men when they hear something like this, uh, he took to drinking. He began to become, like, rebellious and resentful and uh, just being a troublemaker over this disturbing news. Hmm. I'm glad Game of Thrones wasn't out back then because if he compares the trajectory of his life to the famous bastard Jon Snow, Mm -hmm. Elmer McCurdy didn't fare as well as Jon Snow did. No, not at all. Elmer McCurdy took the wrong road Mm -hmm. of illegitimate (laughs) birth. (laughs) And he walked the whole thing drunk, too. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I, I think this whole this information he learned it it he had already started drinking, I think, at a young age, but this definitely sent him off the deep end. Mm-hmm. So by 1900, Elmer McCurdy was a plumber in Maine. After an economic downturn in the town that he was living in, Elmer, like so many other people at this time, decided to move out to the Wild West, and he did not fare a whole lot better there. He landed in Kansas. He worked for a while as a zinc miner. He didn't get a lot of compensation for this job, and a substantial portion of what he did get, he spent on alcohol. So things aren't going well for him, and around 1907, Elmer joins the U.S. Army, and he was stationed at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. In the Army, Elmer was a machine gunner and was into demolitions, and as such, he was given explosives training, including how to use nitroglycerin. And his relationship with nitroglycerin is going to be a complicated one throughout his life. Guess who else was at Fort Leavenworth during this time? Who? A man who would eventually become a five-star general, recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor, and commander of the Pacific Theater in World War II, Douglas MacArthur. You don't say. That was a name I did not expect to come across, and it gets even better. Okay. Okay. So this is obviously before uh, MacArthur becomes a five-star general. Guess what he did at Fort Leavenworth? What? He was a combat engineering instructor at Fort Leavenworth between 1908 and 1912. Combat engineers, I looked it up, specialize in two things. They specialize in construction and demolition. And so Douglas MacArthur was teaching demolition at Fort Leavenworth while McCurdy was there, which means there's a very good chance that Elmer McCurdy learned how to blow shit up with nitroglycerin from Douglas MacArthur. Oh, my goodness. He might not have got the fifth star <laughs> if this had come to light. If, if, if where is the line had been on the air in 19, <laughs> you know, early 1900s, Douglas MacArthur wouldn't have got that, that, that fifth star. So, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, And we're going to get to why. So that's who taught him. It's very likely that that's who taught him. Mm -hmm. There may have been other demolition instructors at Fort Leavenworth at the time. But still, Elmer McCurdy would have come across Douglas MacArthur at some point in his time there. Absolutely. Did you ever get into any kind of explosives when you were a kid? Yeah. Well, I did the typical. um, I would get a bunch of firecrackers and crack them open and pour all the gunpowder into piles or piles with a trail Sometimes piles on top of ant beds. Yeah, and then I would light it up and, uh, you know, tiny little poofs. Uh, what did you do? Have you ever heard of snowball bombs? No. <laughs> I do not know how I found out about this. And I guess if we end up including this, I am just going to be telling people how to make a homemade bomb. I don't feel too bad about that. I mean, you can download the Anarchist Cookbook online, so I don't think that there's I don't think it's a big deal for me to tell people how to make a bomb. I'm going to tell people how to make a bomb. Yeah, this podcast is for 18 and up anyways. Yeah. Adults can handle it. So, so tell me. It's not a very powerful bomb, so okay. it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> probably the worst thing you could do is uh, blow your own fingers off with it, you know. Anyway, if you take aluminum foil, tear off about 25 little pieces, roll it into balls, put it in a bottle, and then put a little bit of a very specific toilet cleaner called Snowbowl in there with it, 
I've heard of that. Okay. Put the lid on it, shake it up, and then run away. So what happens when you do this is that Snowball has, and I didn't know, I had no idea why this happened when I was a kid. I was just blowing shit up. Mm -hmm. But Snowball is made with 15% hydrochloric acid. And so when you combine hydrochloric acid and aluminum, you get hydrogen gas. Okay. And so this release of the hydrogen gas causes the bottle to expand until it eventually explodes. It was lonely in Walker County. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, however, I however I learned about this, uh, I did this a lot. So you're just like you're doing this outside, right? Mm -hmm. Outside your house, perhaps. Yeah. What kind of explosion does it explode? The snowball wetness. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to make one. It's really <laughs> interesting. I encourage everyone at home to try this. <laughs> Not really. You should absolutely <laughs> not try this. But the bottle, if you put it in a plastic bottle, yeah. the bottle will expand mm -hmm. to five or six times its normal size, which is a really interesting thing to watch. It's way cooler than the fucking Mentos shit that everybody does on YouTube. Right, right. Snowball bombs is where it's at. Oh, my gosh. And it doesn't have to be snowball. Find some kind of cleaner that has a high concentration of hydrochloric acid in it. Mix it with a little aluminum foil. Run away. You know what else I used to do with these? What? <laughs> Here's a pro tip. <laughs> if you put a bunch of nails and stuff in the bottle oh, with, the, <laughs> with the, <laughs> you can get shrapnel going <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Nobody do that. Everybody do that. Did you ever put nails in it? Yes. Oh, my God. I put all kinds of stuff in there. Because I blew up probably like 15 of these. Yeah. And then it occurred to me. I could make them more destructive if I put shrapnel in the bottle. Did you ever get hurt? Mm -mm. Did anyone else get hurt? Nope. Did your mom know about this? Mm, I'm sure she heard the explosions. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> she just never come outside to check on me. <laughs> you know. Also, on the subject of explosives, the town that I'm from, which is in Walker County. If you haven't looked up Walker County, you probably should. It is the worst part of Alabama by a lot of people's estimation. Yeah, I would say so. I'm honest to God, kind of terrified of Walker County. <laughs> I mean, growing up in Tuscaloosa County, I always heard stories about Walker County. I mean, the unexplained murders. The lawnmower bomb. Oh, the lawnmower bomb. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That's where Someone the guy got. Someone put a got, car bomb yeah. on a riding lawnmower right. and it blew up. <laughs> That's a, <laughs> we might do a story on the lawnmower car bomb one day. I always heard about the Walker County Mafia. Probably can't even be talking about that. I've heard it many times. My dad used to say that when I was growing up. He also used to say that our UPS man in Samantha, Alabama, was the Grand Dragon of the KKK at the time. But he said at the time, and this was in the late 80s, early 90s in Samantha, Alabama, that this UPS driver was the Grand Wizard. Yeah, or Grand Dragon. No, Grand Wizard. Sorry, I'm not up on my KKK terms. He was the Grand Wizard at the KKK in Samantha, mm. I swear. I don't mean to dispute this story, but I, <laughs> I, I, I do not imagine the Grand Wizard driving a UPS of truck? the clan <laughs> driving not? a UPS truck. He has truck. to have a day job. What, well, what else would he be doing? Isn't David Duke? Hasn't David Duke been the Grand Wizard of the clan for ever? Yeah, but... But don't they have like different, like tinier factions within it, like where they have their own Grand Wizards? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying he was like the Grand Wizard. He just was. <laughs> he was a he was an all right wizard. Yeah. He wasn't the Grand Wizard, but he was all right. He was, I was all right topic. wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Anyways, yeah. Walker right County, wizard. Walker County is truly frightening. Yeah, it is. Certain places. Yeah. Speaking of explosions. I had one more explosion story. The town I'm from only has 250 people in it. So when I say prominent political figure in town, take that to mean a prominent person among 250 people. Worked in the coal mines, and he would still dynamite and sell it to other people in town on the 4th of July. Oh, my gosh. So on the 4th of July, you would hear these huge explosions, and, like, the windows would rattle and things. There was yeah. nothing to look at because... <laughs> You know, it would all be behind trees and things. You wouldn't see anything. But all over the entire town, you would just hear these enormous booms, bigger than anything that you hear at a fireworks right. show. Right. Literally shaking the windows in your house every 4th of July. <laughs> all these rednecks would go out in these abandoned strip pits and set off dynamite that they had bought from one of the more prominent figures in town who had stole it from the coal mines. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's an absolutely true story. <laughs>
Okay, so Elmer McCurdy. In 1910, Elmer leaves the Army, and he starts to look for work. Uh, this is still a period of high unemployment, and he's not having a lot of luck. So he might as well have just stayed in Maine, because he is not faring any better out here uh, west of there. But he decides that he's going to put his explosives training to good use. He and another fellow are going to rob something. <laughs> <laughs> And I say something because uh, nobody knows to this day exactly what they had intended to rob. And the reason that nobody knows that is that these two guys managed to get caught before they even started robbing whatever it was they were going to rob. So they somehow managed to get held up by authorities and they were carrying a bag within which had this whole host of very suspicious items, including a crowbar, gunpowder. And a nitroglycerin funnel. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea how, why the cops stopped them. I, but if I'm carrying a bag with all of that in it, I am going to be as low key as possible. Apparently, they, they were not. They, they got stopped <laughs> before they even reached whatever destination they were going to with all this stuff. So the cops bring them in. They get put in jail. They've got two days to come up with a story about why they had these things on them before their arraignment. And Elmer McCurdy uses these 48 hours very wisely and comes up with the story that he tells to the judge he was going to use these items to invent a machine gun stand that would allow you to fire the machine gun with your foot. <laughs> <laughs> I think I could have on the spot come up with something better than that. Ha Hey, officer, I'm so glad you're here because I was looking for a policeman because we found this bag with all of this weird stuff. I have no idea what any of this is. Oh, yeah, that's you where know, I would go. Something like that. So not very surprisingly, the judge did not buy. He didn't buy that story? No, he did not buy that story. Uh, as, as plausible as it seems, the judge did not believe that these items were going to be used for a foot-operated <laughs> machine gun. <laughs> <laughs> So, but while Elmer's in jail awaiting trial, because obviously this is going to trial at this point, he strikes up a friendship with this man named Walter Jarrett. And Walter's done some time already, but this stint that he's spending in jail is going to be a short one. He's only in there for 30 days for public intox. Uh, this makes him right up Elmer's alley. They got a lot to talk about already. Yeah. Wow, 30 days for public intox. Mm -hmm. And this guy Jarrett is ambitious. He wants to be a train robber. He's probably dreaming about the kind of fame that, that somebody like Jesse James had, uh, who had only died about 30 years before this. And so uh, him and Elmer start talking about potential train robberies, and Elmer tells Jared all about his training and expertise with explosives that he may or may not have gotten from Douglas MacArthur <laughs> in the Army. So these guys are getting along great. They decide they're going to keep in touch after jail. Elmer's court date comes up, and he actually pulls off probably the only impressive thing that he's going to pull off through the entire length of the story. He manages to convince the jury that he actually was... Trying to invent a foot-operated machine gun. <laughs> oh, my gosh. If you look up his explanation for this, uh, apparently he told the jury that uh, the crowbar that they found in the bag was going to be one leg of this uh, tripod that he was going to make. And that he was going to get two more crowbars later on. But the police stopped him <laughs> before he got the other two. So I guess wherever he got that one, they only had one. So he was going to have to go... He was going to have to go to another hardware store to get the other two crowbars. And the jury believed it. Yep. And so uh, Elmer doesn't spend any time in jail, in which technically he has not done anything at this point. He's just carrying a lot of very suspicious items yeah. with him. So when Elmer gets out of jail, he goes from Kansas to Oklahoma to meet with this new friend that he's made, Walter Jarrett, and Walter's posse of five brothers. And these five brothers are kind of known for uh, criminal activity. And these men together, with their new explosives expert, decide that they're going to halt and rob a train. So the day comes, they manage to board this train. They fire so many bullets that in this attempt to intimidate anybody who might try to be a hero, that later on people speculated that there were a lot more bandits robbing the train than there actually right. were. 
So nobody's going to fuck with these guys. They've already brought out the shock and awe. So far, things are going great. They stopped the train. Nobody other than them has pulled a gun. And they have located the safe that they're going to rob. And this means that Elmer's up. This is his time to shine. He's got to <laughs> blow the safe. This is the only reason he's here, really. <laughs> so he sets a charge on the safe. Everybody clears out. And this enormous explosion goes off. They run back into the safe to get the money, but the door won't open. He sets another charge. They run out of the train car again. Huge explosion goes off. They run back to get the money, and the door still won't open. And this happens four times. <laughs> <laughs> On the fourth time, Elmer says, this is getting a little bit embarrassing. I'm going to make sure the door opens this time. So he puts... Uh, Quite a bit more explosives on the safe. This time, everybody runs out. A huge explosion goes off. Way bigger than the other explosion. So big, in fact, that it blew the side of the train car off. Amazing. They go back in. The safe is open. Unfortunately, though, most of the money inside was in the form of coinage. And during these four explosions it had melted and fused to the side of the safe <laughs> <laughs> gosh that's rough so these four blasts all of all of this all of this that they've been doing to try to get the safe open has taken several hours and the train's getting close to Oklahoma City so these guys just start rummaging through the mail car <laughs> to find whatever cash they can find that somebody might have been sending to somebody you know, cards from grandma or something with like a dollar in it. <laughs> they pick up whatever coins they find that blew out of the safe. <laughs> Most of them are melted and very obviously, if they were to try to spend them, came from this robbery, which will become notorious for the melted coinage that it produced. <laughs> uh, they, so they, they still have a couple of watches off some people. They're out of time. They got to they gotta go. Right. Most sources that you find are going to say that these guys got away with $450, which they would have had to split four ways. But it might even be worse than that. Uh, I found an article in a uh, in the New Orleans newspaper called the Times Picayune, and um, in this article they talked to the superintendent of the Pacific Express Company, which was the company that operated these trains. He had surveyed the train, and they had gone through what was missing and what had been destroyed, and he told the Times-Picayune, quote, The safe carried no more than $3,000, taking into consideration the amount of damaged money upon which cannot be recovered. I do not see how the robbers profited more than $100 by their work. So a high estimate of how much Elmer McCurdy left with is $112. The low estimate's $25. That's rough. Yeah. That's an embarrassment. So he blows the entire side, completely destroys a train <laughs> car, and gets away with somewhere between $25 and $112. <laughs> it doesn't take the police very long at all to figure out who did this. The Jarrett boys are known for criminal activity, so that seems to be pretty much the first place that the cops went. And so the police show up at Walter Jarrett's house. Elmer isn't there, but a couple of these Jarrett guys get picked up. One of them ends up doing some pretty hard time. Even though Elmer wasn't there, he's still in some very serious trouble since in the basement of the Jarrett home, they find Elmer's army discharge papers literally sitting next to nitroglycerin. What? <laughs> oh my God. I, you know, <laughs> let's just go all in on this episode. We've already told people how to make a bomb. If you want to do some criminal activity with it, here's how you get away with it. If you're going to go blow some shit up with a bomb, before you leave the house with this apparatus of destruction, put the snowball, the empty snowball bottle in your neighbor's trash can. <laughs> <laughs> Clean up all of the stuff that you use to make your implements of destruction before you go out and commit the destruction. If the cops show up at your house, they're going to find it. And certainly don't just leave your driver's license sitting next to your bomb-making parts. <laughs> so now Elmer's a wanted man. He makes his way to the Osage Nation and starts going by a lot of aliases. Ah, what was one of those aliases? Charles Smith. 
His mm-hmm. uncle daddy's name. His uncle daddy's name. He starts going by his uncle daddy's name. So in the Osage Nation, he ends up in Pawhuska, uh, which is a town named after a former Osage chief. Pawhuska, if you're interested, means white hair. So I'm guessing ah. the chief that this was named after wasn't a young guy. Mm-hmm. This is a pretty small town now. It's just got a few thousand people in it. But back then, it seemed like it was kind of on the boom. And the, the population of this town was... Fairly split between white people who had moved in, who had migrated west, and the Osage natives who did a lot of trading with the uh, the pale faces. Oh, yeah. And is that a racist term, pale faces? You can't make racist terms about white people, right? No. I call white people pale faces, Exactly. Right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the Osage had... Uh, apparently accumulated considerable amount of wealth uh, in trading with the white people who had moved out there. And um, a lot of the the money that's coming through on these trains belonged to the Osage. Right. And also, there is apparently a very decent bar scene in Paul Huska. Oh, nice. And as we've talked about already, Elmer McCurdy liked to drink. Yes, he did. So while Elmer McCurdy is in Paul Huska doing all this drinking, he meets Amos Hayes and Elijah Higgins. Now, like the Jarrett boys from earlier, these are some rough characters that have found themselves on the wrong side of the law before. And like the Jarrett boys, Elmer tells his new friends (laughs) about all of his acumen in the field of explosives. (laughs) I'm guessing he left out parts. (laughs) Because uh, Amos Hayes and Elijah Higgins... uh, Decide that uh, Elmer, McC- Elmer McCurdy is exactly what they've been looking for, and they decide they're going to rob a bank with Elmer. So in September of 1911, at around midnight, they cut the electrical lines to this bank, and they spend the following two hours trying to beat a hole in the side of the bank that faced this alleyway. So after two hours of beating on this wall with pickaxes, they finally get inside, and Elmer rigs a charge on the bank vault... He's not going to go through the embarrassment that he had during the train robbery where he tries this four times and doesn't get it open. So he puts plenty of explosives on it this time. Excellent. The guys clear out. This charge goes off. And Elmer had used so much explosives on this vault that the vault didn't just open. It blew the door completely off its hinges. (laughs) And it flew through the bank destroying pretty much the entirety of the interior of this bank. Oh, my God. This explosion was was so violent that it broke the windows out of the businesses across the street. <laughs> <laughs> he, he might have overdone it with explosives, but the door is definitely open. It's not even on the vault anymore. Success, yeah. Yeah, success. They're, they're, they're in the vault. So they, they know the door is open. They run back in there. They did They did blow the one door off the hinges. Turns out there was two doors on this vault. They find out that there's a second door, an interior door on this vault. Elmer rigs up another charge on this one. The guys all run outside through that hole they had made, and nothing happens. Really? So they run back, and Elmer runs back inside, tries to figure out why this charge didn't go off. Higgins, who is their lookout for this bank robbery, is kind of saying, hey, we just set off an explosion that was so big that it blew the windows out of the adjacent buildings. <laughs> we don't really have time to for this. And Higgins runs away. Jeez. And so now Elmer and Hayes are left in the bank. Elmer futzes around with this, this charge that he set a little bit more. And then Elmer and... Amos Hayes decide, like Higgins, we don't really have time to be sticking around here. So they just go through the uh, the teller drawers and get whatever money they can find out of that and leave. Right. So, <laughs> so at this point, Elmer McCurdy <laughs> has blown the entire side out of a train. <laughs> he has beaten a hole in the side of a bank. Set off an explosion that was so big that a vault door flew through the bank, destroying essentially everything. And it's so big, in fact, that it blew the windows out of the businesses across the street. And for all of this, he has now netted somewhere between $75 and $162. <laughs> oh my God. I feel bad for him. I do, too. 
I'm feeling real bad for him. And this yeah. does not get it does not get any better for this guy, even in death. <laughs> <laughs> so after the second bungled robbery attempt, Elmer starts feeling pretty down. He finds a guy that's going to let him sleep in a shed that's outside this man's house. And for a couple of weeks, Elmer just lays in this shed, drinking whiskey and yelling gibberish at everybody that walks by. Oh, my God. Elmer starts coming out of this drunken, yelling at strangers funk that he's in. And before Elmer and these new friends that he tried to rob this bank with robbed the bank, they were already aware of what would be a huge score if they could pull it off. And they made plans to try this. There was a money train that traveled to and from Pawhuska that would transport this enormous wealth that these Osage had accumulated. It's common knowledge in Pawhuska that this train regularly carries in excess of $400,000. And that's a lot now. Yes. That would be a good robbery now, $400,000. But in 1911, $400,000 is the equivalent to $10.3 million. Absolutely. That's insane money. So in the month following this bank robbery where they did not get away with very much, the train's due to come through Paul Huska. McCurdy and these two friends from the bank heist, Amos Hayes and Elijah Higgins, along with maybe one other man, decide they're going to rob it. The train schedule, like I said, is public knowledge, so they know when the train is due to come through. They know what track it's going to be on. The guys follow the tracks to this remote area well outside of town to wait on this train to pass through. Elmer has his explosives prepared. They're getting ready. They see the train in the distance coming down the tracks. But they look at their watches and they realize that the train's running considerably earlier than it should be. And these trains are pretty known for their uh, punctuality. Exactly. But anyway, here comes a train. So they <laughs> scramble to light this bonfire on the tracks. There's some conflicting stories about how they stop this train. I'm going to go with they, they put a bonfire on the tracks because it had to be something that the train conductor could see from a distance away. Yeah. So whatever they did... This was seen by the conductor. He starts slowing down the train, and it comes to a stop. So once this train stops, Elmer and his little posse start just unloading on this train. It's the shock and awe tactic from before. And this worked before. That part of the plan was fine. That intimidation tactic to keep anybody from trying to be a hero by throwing this hail of bullets out of the train is a pretty good idea. So if you're ever going to rob a train, just shoot the shit out of it before you get on it. <laughs> <laughs> Take your snowball bomb on there. <laughs> Said bring a bunch of snowball with you and just set all that off around the train. Nobody will fuck with you when you get on there. <laughs> so they uncouple the passenger car and they get the engineer to start moving the train again. So that's less likelihood of, you know, anybody in this passenger car deciding that they're they're going to try to fight these guys yeah. or something. So, so they move the train about a mile up the tracks. So now they've got this manageable small group of people to contend with. And they don't have to worry so much about all these passengers. It's time for Elmer McCurdy to step up again and blow the safe. Oh, my. They're about... To make themselves immortal by pulling off the biggest train heist in the history of the world. They can't find the safe, though. They know it's up here somewhere, but they can't find it. At least they can't find the safe that they were expecting to find. And they can't find it because it's not there. It's not in the passenger car that they uncoupled and left behind either, if that's what you're thinking. It's not anywhere on any part of this train. Do you know why? Why? It's the wrong fucking train. It's the wrong fucking train. <laughs> <laughs> so just like their Elmer's previous foray into train heists, he has to settle with rummaging through the mail sacks to get whatever little bit of cash grandmothers have sent to their grandchildren oh and God. birthday cards. I can't take it for him. But on the upside... They come across several jugs of whiskey, and Elmer loves whiskey. Yes. So at least there's that. That's a boon. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't get much money. Uh -huh. um, they manage to get $46 in cash <laughs> on this heist. Yes. Which they have to split four ways. 
and, and it actually turns out that uh, in in some articles, uh, a lot of the people in this car that, you know, if, if the passenger car had still been there, they could have gone through the passenger car and taken money and things from people. But they let that go. So they're stealing the money essentially from this train's crew. These guys are from the West. As soon as they hear this gunfire coming outside, they start hiding their wallets. So, right. uh, <laughs> so most of these people, like you can find articles of the people who were employed by Pacific or whatever it was, where they talk about where they hid their wallets when these guys jumped on the train. I just wanted to point out, I find it really funny. Papers back then, after this heist, were describing the haul that Elmer McCurdy and his fellow robbers <laughs> took as and I quote, one of the smallest in the history of train robbing. <laughs> yeah, so, so embarrassing. Yeah, yeah, it is. And they went from believing that they were about to pull off the biggest train heist in history to having a quote in the paper about them <laughs> 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 that notes that it probably was the smallest train heist in the history of the world. <laughs> so... They escape from the train. Once they leave the train with this $46, they head south. But they're not going south. They've got a getaway plan. What they're going to do is to s deceive anyone who might pursue them by initially heading south and then doubling back and going north. Unfortunately, though, it had been raining. So... Essentially, what they have done is just leave tracks that go <laughs> south and then the tracks <laughs> curve and go back north. Oh, my God. <laughs> so it's really it's only the next morning when they find them. <laughs> you can literally follow Elmer McCurdy's tracks to where he is the next morning. And where he is is in the shack that he's been staying in, curled up with uh, some jugs of whiskey and... He is straight hammered. Yes. Elmer, at this point, I think is just kind of given up. I mean... I think so, too. I think he knows the tracks are leading exactly to where he is, and he's just going to lay down and just get hammered. So the next morning, the morning following this train robbery, the popo follow <laughs> Elmer's tracks back to the shack. Elmer's sloshed, and he just starts cursing at them. So he's gone, he's fallen back into uh, screaming at anyone who comes up to his shack that he's living in. <laughs> so he's uttering fuck word after fuck word at these police. And this apparently goes on for an entire hour. He is just cursing the law for an hour, just screaming at them. There's not a lot of agreement on how the ensuing gun battle actually went down after this hour-long tirade of Elmer's. All we know for sure is that there was a hellacious amount of gunfire that broke out, and this apparently lasted for another full hour. At the end of which, Elmer McCurdy takes a bullet to the chest, and he dies drunk in this shack on October 7th, 1911. So this is still 1911, and as we've discussed in other episodes, people during this period enjoyed little more than looking at dead bodies. So of course... A crowd gathers around to look at the corpse of the bandit that had been slain in the shootout with police. And this is something that Elmer's corpse is going to have to get used to. It would be another 66 years before Elmer's body gets put to rest. So after this gun battle that results in Elmer's death, he's taken to Johnson's funeral home. McCurdy didn't really have any family that, or at least didn't have any family that wanted to claim the body. So the funeral director pumped Elmer McCurdy with a concoction of embalming fluid and arsenic and put Elmer's body on display. His reasoning, his claimed reasoning for this, is that he was not reimbursed for the autopsy and the embalming that he performed on McCurdy. I spent a lot of time looking up uh -huh. Oklahoma state laws from 1910, and there are actually several laws that cover this and Joseph Johnson appears to be breaking all of them. Really? One of the laws has to do with arresting or attaching a dead body. And it says that um, anyone who attaches a dead body to any kind of debt or demand or detains a body in order to collect on a debt is guilty of a misdemeanor. Oh, my. It would look like Johnson is guilty of breaking this law. There's also a law, an Oklahoma 1910 law, that has to do with the disposal of dead bodies that says that 
as the coroner, you're supposed to try to collect the money for the burial from the family. If you can't do that, you're supposed to take the money from whatever estate or belongings that the deceased might have. Right. Elmer had neither in the area. If all that fails, the coroner is supposed to submit a request in writing to the district court of the county to be reimbursed. Jeff Johnson did do that. <laughs> Clearly, he just propped Elmer up. I did find a loophole, though, that I think that Joseph Johnson was operating under. Okay. There is a law on the books in 1910 concerning who is entitled to custody of a body. So this law says, quote, the person charged by law with the duty of burying the body of a deceased person is entitled to the custody of such body for the purpose of burying it. Obviously, he didn't bury it. No, he didn't. But the law goes on to say, quote, except that in the cases in which an inquest is required by law to be held upon a dead body by a coroner, such coroner is entitled to its custody until such inquest has been completed. Oh. So the purpose of that law clearly is that you do not have to bury a body if you're still examining it as the coroner. Yeah. Joseph Johnson might have taken advantage of this law, though, by thinking, well, if somebody calls me out on keeping this dead body, I can just claim that I'm not done examining it. <laughs> <laughs> and a coroner in the law books of Oklahoma in 1910 is the only person who can hold on to a dead body. So a lot of people are about to break these Oklahoma laws. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So Joseph Johnson has Elmer McCurdy's body on display in his funeral home. And this is a time where outlaws and gunslingers are still really popular and they capture a lot of the interest of the public. It only been about 25 years since people like Doc Holliday and Jesse James had died. A few of those old Big West names are still around at this time. Uh, Wyatt Earp and Buffalo Bill are still alive. Okay. So just to put a little context of where yeah. we are in history. So when McCurdy dies in the shootout, kind of the bumbling aspects of his uh, life of crime get intentionally overlooked. I think it makes a more compelling story if Joseph Johnson says that this is a <laughs> badass outlaw, not a guy that <laughs> blew, <laughs> blew up a bank and didn't get away from the money and blew up a safe and accidentally fused the money to the side of the safe. Um, so when word gets out that there's uh, this quote-unquote famous outlaw hanging out dead in this uh, funeral home, a lot of people want to come up and see it, and people came from all over to do so. And through this whole time, there's all these carnival owners that are coming up offering Joseph Johnson a lot of money yes. to buy this body. Yes. But he's not selling. For one thing, Johnson claims that he's keeping this body in the hopes that a family member will one day <laughs> come and claim it. But this is bringing a lot of business to his funeral home. So I feel like Joseph, I mean, I'm a cynical person. I feel like Joseph Johnson might have had some ulterior motives about keeping this body around. I think you may be right. I, I am almost completely certain. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if he wanted to just keep the body around in the hopes that a family member was going to come get it, what was he going to do when they showed up and he's got the, you know, body right there? Exactly, on display. The <laughs> that would be horrible. Like, you find out that, like, your, your dad died you know, a couple states over and you go to get his body and you walk in, you know, thinking, oh, I'm just going to ask for whoever's in charge here. And then you look over in the corner and your dad is standing there. And at this point, were they shoving nickels in his mouth? Yes, because it was a nickel a piece or, or it was called like a nickel a look. But yeah, you could uh, take your nickel and put it in Elmer's mouth as a way of payment. But it was just a fun thing to do. I don't know if they were making wishes that, that's just me speculating. <laughs> the dead body wishing well. Yes, I'm speculating on that. But they definitely, and we know this to be true because later on, when Elmer's found, they those, find those, those nickels turn some out nickels. to be helpful in identifying the body later on. Yes. I read that at first Elmer was in, after he was deceased and embalmed, uh, they put him in some nice clothes and shaved his face. But when, he, when uh, Joseph Johnson decided to make Elmer this attraction, this awesome outlaw bandit, attraction he put elmer back in his own street clothes mm -hmm. and uh put the long gun in his the hand. clothes from the shootout yeah <laughs> <sighs> yeah well you can't have your outlaws looking all uppity and nice you know <laughs> so uh 
Elmer's body is on display in Johnson's funeral home for about a year, and he gets a little bit of company. One of his former partners in crime, Walter Jarrett, gets shot while he's trying to rob another bank, and he dies. Oh, one of the Jarrett boys. Yeah, and for a bit, um, he's on display in this funeral <laughs> home with Elmer. So Joseph Johnson just says, I got another one. Let's just uh, <laughs> just start propping, propping bodies up in this place. People come put nickels in their mouths. But uh, Walter Jarrett doesn't stay there very long because his family, he actually has family in the area, and they come and claim him. So poor Elmer is by himself again. You want to talk about the roller skates? I read, and I read this in numerous places, so I want to believe it's true. But there's rumor that the Johnson boys, and that would be some sons of Joseph Johnson, they decided they wanted to take it up a notch, and they strapped some old-timey roller skates onto the bottom of Elmer's feet, and they wanted to create a spooky attraction to scare the little kids, and they would roll them out, pull them back in, I guess. I don't know. Maybe with a string. I'm just imagining <laughs> that that's what I would do. But, uh, to scare the little children who come yeah. to the funeral home. Um, <laughs> Yeah, if you're a child going into a funeral home, that might not be a good day for you already. Yeah. (laughs) I hope they had some kind of vetting process for what children they were going to scare with us, because you don't want to, like, have a kid that's come in there who's just lost his mother. Exactly. And then all of a sudden there's a corpse on roller skates chasing chasing (laughs) him around the, the funeral home. So... This all goes on for about five years until the Great Patterson Carnival Show turns up in Kansas City, which is about 50 miles north of Paw Huska, uh, where Elmer and Johnson's funeral home are, are at this point. So what does that have to do with anything? Well, coincidentally, at the same time that the Great Patterson Carnival shows nearby, Elmer McCurdy's long-lost brother shows up at the funeral home to claim Elmer's body. You don't say. I know. Turns out Elmer McCurdy did not have a brother. And two weeks later, Elmer turns up on display at a carnival in Texas attached to the Great Patterson Carnival Show. So James Patterson calls the Osage County Sheriff, uh, calling himself Aver, claiming to be the long lost brother of Elmer McCurdy. And they want to take him home, give him a good burial, uh, you know, ship his body back to San Francisco for a true proper burial. And so the Osage County Sheriff is cool with that. He's like, yeah, go talk to Joseph Johnson. It's not going to be a problem. So then James Patterson, calling himself Aver, goes the next day to the Johnson funeral home with his other Patterson brother, who's calling himself Wayne. And he's also claiming to be a long-lost brother of Elmer. And under this ruse, they get custody of Elmer's body. Yeah. And they, they respect his remains. Of by course. putting him in a sideshow, <laughs> <laughs> along with little people and bearded women. Uh, you know, what's funny about that is that if you look at the newspaper articles from back then, there's all of these articles about Patterson's carnival show. Yeah. And he's always touted as a clean show. You know, I don't think they ever I say a that. Christian show, but they're always they always say, you know, this is a clean show. There's no gambling here. This is this is where, this is somewhere you can bring your kids to the Patterson Carnival shows. But as it turns out, Patterson actually had a warrant out for his arrest in Really? Yeah, he was <laughs> he had some illegal gambling machines going on <laughs> in in his uh in his carnival show. That sounds right. <laughs> and that show had other problems, too. At, at one time, uh, one of his elephants got loose and trampled a school playground in the town that they were visiting. Oh, my. And then in 1916, his lions ate somebody in North Dakota. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, you know what? I don't feel bad about that. No, I don't either, really. I hate animals being used in mm-hmm. carnivals and circuses. I always have. I liked it when I was a kid and I didn't know any better. I was like, wow, look at an elephant in uh, real life. And then, yeah. I mean, it, that was very young. It wasn't, I wasn't very old before I realized they, they don't look happy. Uh, the first time my parents took me to the Barnum and Bailey Circus. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I thought it was awesome. I thought the animals were great. I didn't know any better that, you know, they're being horribly abused. But I loved the show. But afterwards, we were kind of milling around like outside of the big circus tent. And I mean, there was like concessions around and somehow I, 
you know, got away from my parents because they were like buying food. I don't know. I just know that I started walking around on my own and I walked around this giant tent and there is one of the clowns from the show pissing on the <laughs> side of the tent. <laughs> I saw his penis uh, in his hands. Okay. Really? Yes, this is true. And this is why I have always been afraid of clowns. And he kind of is pissing on the side of the tent. He kind of looks at me and gives me like this little sideways smile. And I go running back to my mom and dad, and I'm crying. And then my dad spanks the shit out of me because uh, I went, you know, wandering around. But And this was before I even knew anything about John Wayne Gacy. Mm. I'm just like five or six. But at that moment, I knew that there was something about clowns, and not just the clown who I saw as penis, but I knew there was something about clowns that was not right. They were hiding something. Evil. True evil. And I've always known that. I I had this moment earlier today where I was thinking, you know what? It's been a long time since we haven't used the word penis in an episode, and this is going to be the one. It hasn't come up yet. We're going to make it all the way through this without saying the word penis, but... Nope. I'm sorry. Maybe next time. Well, I thought this would be the only chance for me to tell my circus clown (laughs) penis story. Well, that's fine. Okay. (laughs) So for several years, uh, Elmer is part of this Patterson Shide show. So he would have been propped up uh, in or somewhere near the entrance of these tents alongside bearded ladies and uh, little people and, uh, you know, people with various physical deformities, which were all the rage in terms of amusement back then. For several years, he would have traveled back and forth across the country with the great Patterson shows. For Patterson, though, Elmer's corpse was never really a main attraction. It was just kind of uh, an icing on the cake, just a, uh, an, added, an added bonus for people that are going to these shows. But then in 1922, Elmer's remains end up in the hands of a man named Lewis Sonny. And Sonny's an ex-cop who had shortly before this claimed a $5,000 reward because he captured a train robber named Roy Gardner. Have you ever heard of Roy Gardner? Not until recently, yeah. Yeah, no, neither have I, but Sonny was really proud of himself over this. He (laughs) actually even made a movie called The Man Who Captured Roy Gardner, I believe, starring himself. Oh my gosh, (laughs) that's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) So Sonny was just a, you know, kind of a beat cop, but he'd always sort of fancied himself a showman that had kind of missed his opportunity. So when he gets this $5,000 reward for catching this criminal that nobody's really ever heard of, he decides that he's going to start up a traveling wax museum. (laughs) That's just some weird thing to just... Want to delve into as like your life's work or... Yeah, like your missed opportunity. Yeah, I mean, it's not like he fell. It's not like this was the family business or anything. He was a cop. He gets $5,000 and he says, wax museum. That's what I need to do. Um, But anyway, he starts up uh, this traveling wax museum show, and he does a lot of weird things. So in order to attract people to the show, he likes to stand out in front of whatever location that they're they're settling into and, uh, you know, kind of shout about the show. And he actually does this bit where uh, he will handcuff people really fast (laughs) (laughs) to show off. You know, I was a former cop. Here's how fast I can handcuff people. Oh, gosh. He thought this was amazing. I don't know if if other people did or not. So Sonny starts up this Museum of Crime, which is essentially themed wax museum. Along one wall, he has wax sculptures of all of these famous criminals like Jesse James. For whatever reason, along the other wall, staring at the criminals, he has wax figures of former presidents <laughs> who just <laughs> stare across the room at the criminals. And then in the very back, he has an actual criminal. Uh, so Sonny claims that, uh, you know, that, that, that this is a famous outlaw. This is Elmer McCurdy, the famous outlaw. So as people are browsing these wax sculptures, when they make their way to the back, they can uh, get a look at the actual corpse of a real-life outlaw. And some of the people apparently took it upon themselves to stuff their ticket stubs in McCurdy's mouth, which, like the nickels from before, turn out to be a, a, a good indicator during Elmer's autopsy of who this person might be. Yeah, and you know, I find it so incredibly weird that the ticket stubs were then put in his mouth. It's like, what? 
I understand the nickels almost, but did they? I don't think, I mean, you know, you'll see things that say that, you know, maybe people were encouraged to shove their ticket stubs into the mouth. Yeah. That's one of those things that's not really verifiable. Mm -hmm. And I Mm kind of feel more like, so people came in, they looked at McCurdy, maybe somebody dared somebody stick something in his mouth. And somebody shoved a ticket stub in there, maybe while Sonny wasn't looking could be. So eventually, Lewis Sonny gets tired of this road life where he's having to set up these wax figures and then break all this back down and move along down the road. So he sets up a permanent wax museum in Los Angeles. And Elmer spends most of his time inside this museum. But Sonny does occasionally rent this corpse out for special occasions. <laughs> <laughs> One of these special occasions is the Bunyan Derby. Also known as a Trans-American foot race. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in 1928, this was a foot race from California to New York. So the idea here is that as these people are running down mostly Route 66 uh, in this race to New York, the promoter of this race, a man named C.C. Pyle, would kind of take a, take a sort of a sideshow into the towns along the path of this race. That's fun. <laughs> it turns out that C.C. Pyle is a dick. Total dick. <laughs> <laughs> what he was doing. So you have these poor people who were running all this distance. And C.C. Pyle realizes that when towns are close together, a lot of time there's a little rivalry between the towns. So he'll go to these towns that are situated somewhere near each other who might have a close rival yeah. and say, the race is coming through one of these towns. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe hold out his hand a little bit, you know. The race is coming through the town that gives me the most money. That's so wrong. I know. So he's taking all of his money from these little towns on the route of this race. And on top of that, these people who uh, have been exhausted <laughs> for weeks, a lot of times they're having to run off course because a town a few miles <laughs> off the path of where they're you know, where the route should run, gave a pile a little extra money. So now all of these runners <laughs> make this weird winding trip that is basically along Route 66, but detours based on who gives pile enough money. So Elmer McCurdy, our corpse, is essentially at every stop along this route, except suspiciously when the race crosses through Oklahoma. Now... Why do you think that would be? I think maybe uh, the upstanding businessman, C.C. Pyle, <laughs> knew where this corpse came from and thought, if that shows up in Oklahoma, somebody might come claim this. <laughs> so we can't let that happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Elmer McCurdy shows up at every stop along the way, except those stops which occur in Oklahoma. So um, by this point, all of this traveling that Elmer's done, he's looked better. Um, I imagine some wear and tears happened. Yeah, he's starting to fall apart a little bit. He's mummified now. <laughs> he no longer really looks much like a person. He looks like a mummy. And he's you. kind of a uh, shrunken. He has also shrank. <laughs> <laughs> and he's starting to look a little uh, more grotesque than what Sonny had envisioned <laughs> as the genuine dead outlaw in his museum. Because, you know, he's he's just, he's a, a rental for this race. He's exactly. coming back to Sonny. Yeah. Uh, but by the time he gets back there, he's not looking like something Sonny wants in his museum. That makes me feel so bad. Yeah. I mean, he wouldn't, I'm, I'm not going to, never mind. I'm not going to talk about Elmer's looks. He, he wouldn't handsome to start with, though. <laughs> <laughs> so in comes Dwayne Esper. Esper's a movie director whose specialty is exploitation films. Yes. At this point, freak shows and sideshows like those that Elmer's really been traveling around extensively with are starting to pass this torch of capturing people's interests and things that shock and frighten them over to the movie industry. So late 1920s, early 30s uh, is kind of the beginning of these exploitation movies. And this is when you get movies like Reefer Madness. Yeah. And marijuana. (laughs) Yeah. Marijuana. Yeah. I'm sorry. Marijuana. Yeah. And it... But these movies, so later on you get these exploitation movies that are just these essentially just rape fantasies and these Nazi exploitation movies. But before that, the the origins of these exploitation movies is here. 
but at the time they're they're releasing these movies under the guise of educational content. Exactly. So they're quite clearly just out to shock and titillate people. But as long as they say that this is an educational film, they're getting away with it. So Esper in 1933 directs one of these exploitation movies called Narcotic. So a lot of people think that Elmer's actually in this movie, Narcotic. He's not. He's not. But he was part of the promotional efforts for this movie. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> when the movie Narcotic would open up in a new town, Elmer McCurdy's corpse would sit in the lobby. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah, Dwayne Esper was renting McCurdy's body for what is said to be $100 a month. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I didn't see the figure on that. Yeah. I saw that in several different places. Uh, he was renting it from Lewis Sonny mm-hmm. for $100 a month to be displayed in the side of these lobbies of whatever movie theater narcotic exclamation point was being shown at. He, <laughs> Elmer McCurdy, as this attraction inside of these movie theater lobbies, was labeled Dead Dope Fiend. <laughs> and the director, Esper, claimed that this dead dope fiend had killed himself while surrounded by police after having robbed a drugstore to support his habit. And look at how drugs have ravaged this man's body. (laughs) (laughs) Wasn't there something like his body was preserved or something in its weird state because of he had so many drugs in his system or something like that? I believe so, yeah. And at that point, McCurdy's body, as we have said, was mummified. Uh, His skin was hardened and shriveled. It had shrunk in size, almost to the size of like an eight or nine year old boy. That's what drugs will do to you. Yeah. (laughs) You will shrink and turn to leather (laughs) and die. So that must have been frightening for people going to see Narcotic Exclamation Point. Yeah, Um, I would imagine. Yeah. yeah, If y'all go to see a movie and there's a dead body in the lobby. (laughs) (laughs) That's a, I think that would turn a lot of people away nowadays. Yeah. Um, I used to work in a movie theater and we never never had promotional Dead bodies. Uh, supplies like that, no. <laughs> He's got some cardboard cutouts. Yeah, so 22 years after his death, Elmer McCurdy turns to drugs. <laughs> so McCurdy did not appear in this movie Narcotic. He may have appeared in one of these kind of series of short films that Esper had also made. Those movies were called March of Crime. I went through... Some of them today, and I could not spot Elmer, but he might be in one of those. Okay. Uh, So once this publicity tour concludes, Elmer gets tossed into storage, where he mostly stays put for the next 30 years. So Elmer stays in storage for several decades until 1966, when legendary exploitation movie writer and producer David Friedman pulls him out. So Friedman has made some of what fans of exploitation films would call classics. <laughs> so he was uh, at least partially responsible for Ilsa, She-Wolf of the SS. Yeah. Blood Feast. But Friedman made a lot of movies, and uh, included in those are some not-so-classic ones. For example, the film The Ramrodder. The Ramrodder. <laughs> the Ramrodder. He had another one, the adult version of Jekyll and Hyde, and that's actually the title of the movie. It says on the box, the adult version <laughs> of Jekyll and Hyde. <laughs> and my favorite title of uh, some of Friedman's uh, lesser known movies is A Smell of Honey, A Swallow of Brine. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and that's, I get the feeling that movies, the, the plot of that movie is about what you think it is. I'm pretty sure it's about blowjobs. Yeah, I think so. So uh, Friedman gets Elmer, and he's going to be included as sort of a prop in the backdrop of this movie that he's got upcoming called She Freak. And they actually do set Elmer up in the background for one scene. And they film him, but unfortunately, Elmer's part in this movie gets cut during editing, so he doesn't actually appear in Chief Freak, and he has once again lost his shot at Silver Screen. So by the time Friedman gets a hold of Elmer's body, uh, ownership of Elmer's body has actually been passed down from Lewis Sonny to his son, Dan Sonny. And Dan's not particularly fond of uh, this corpse. 
that he has inherited, but he can't get rid of the thing because it's, you know, it's the 60s now and dead bodies aren't really all the rage as they used to be. Um, I know. And you can't really just set them out places like you used to. <laughs> you know, like back in the good old days when you could prop dead bodies up and use them as a means to get a crowd drawn. So Dan Sonny is kind of just stuck with Elmer McCurdy's corpse. He doesn't really like it, doesn't really want to have it, but he can't sell it to anybody. So it's just kind of hanging out in storage. Until a couple of entrepreneurs show up and they buy Dan Sonny out of his entire inventory, including Elmer McCurdy. So they came here to buy all these wax figures. They wanted to start their own wax museum and they end up with this dead body. It kind of looks like maybe Dan Sonny took advantage of the situation to get rid of this dead body because apparently these guys that bought this collection didn't know that there was a dead body included exactly. in what they were buying. They thought it was just another wax figure. They say they thought it was just another <laughs> wax figure. For all of the wax figures, including Elmer McCurdy, that they bought from Dan Sonny, $10,000 for the whole lot. So these guys buy this collection of wax figures and they take it on tour. You'll find a lot of articles and, and things, modern articles and things that say that Elmer went on tour with these guys. He did not. He was actually never part of this wax show that they were that they started taking around the country. Uh, it turns out by this point, Elmer had become what you might describe as powerful ugly. <laughs> <laughs> he was, <laughs> he was they, they, the new owners of, uh, of all these wax figures, believing that this is a wax figure, think they're supposedly believing that this is a wax figure, feel like it's uh, – this is something that's going to scare people away. They don't They don't want to include this in their show. No one wants to see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By this point, he possibly was missing the tips of his ears, the yeah. ends of some of his fingers and toes. Yeah. He was kind of falling apart. Yeah. But while they don't want Elmer as part of their wax museum, his current state of hideousness is perfectly suited for a spook house. Oh, most definitely. So one of Elmer's new owners in this partnership, uh, who had bought all these wax figures, Don Crisdale, starts preparing what he claims to believe is a wax figure. Now, if you see pictures of Elmer during this time, it doesn't... I mean, if that's a wax figure, that is some uh, high-level special effects. Yeah, who would do such a thing? So Crisdale's idea is he's going to prop the wax figure... Up in a coffin, and he's going to attach some kind of mechanism to it so that it'll jerk around and scare people. <laughs> <laughs> and in his preparation for this, he drills holes in Elmer's feet to attach whatever apparatus he's come up with to achieve this effect. And while he's drilling one of these holes in Elmer's feet, he notices that when he pulls his drill out, there's some kind of yellow fluid attached to the drill bit. Oh my gosh. I don't know how at this point. He's not like, yellow fluid doesn't usually come out of wax figures. <laughs> but <laughs> according to him, he sees this yellow fluid and uh, he's just like, whatever. And moves along and goes ahead and sets this mechanism up to that's, Elmer. That's some powerful denial. Yeah. <laughs> so they set this coffin with Elmer McCurdy in it. Out in front of this museum, and whenever somebody gets too close to it, they activate whatever this mechanism is, and Elmer starts jiggling and scaring people. <laughs> <laughs> so, turns out uh, wax museums aren't profitable enough in these days to keep them running. So the owners get behind on their rent and they just bolt and leave a lot of their inventory behind, including Elmer McCurdy's remains. And so now we're at this point where the last person that knew that this was a real human corpse was Dan Sonny. Supposedly, these guys that took over the corpse didn't know. Right. I'm pretty sure they knew. Yeah. But when they leave and leave the body behind, which gets turned over to the owner of the building, which is the Long Beach Amusement Company. And these guys genuinely don't know that this is a dead body. <laughs> So, and I believe that they don't know because of what they did with it the first year that they had it. Do you know what they did with it? What? <laughs> they don't have any immediate use for it. And apparently they're running low on storage. So they have a resident electrician. Yeah. And they tell this guy, uh, can you keep this in your closet for a little while? Because we don't have anywhere to put it. Really? So this guy that's working for the Long Beach Amusement Company keeps a dead body in his closet for a year. Oh, my God. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, but they haven't lost track of them or anything. They know that they've got this this prop that's going to come in handy for something. And so, finally, they're updating this attraction that they have called the Laugh in the Dark Funhouse. And they say, okay, we've got this prop corpse thing mm-hmm. uh, that'll go great in here. It's supposed to be a scary thing, so that'll go fantastic here. So they they spray paint <laughs> Elmer. <laughs> Kind of this orange color so that when these blue lights flash off of him, it kind of looks like he's glowing. And they hang him up in uh, this Laugh in the Dark funhouse. And he stays there for four years. And people walk through this funhouse. When they get close to where Elmer is hanging, they trigger something that causes this light to shine. And oh my God, they see this dead body hanging from the ceiling. So for four years, people are... (laughs) Walking through this fun house, unaware that they are looking at a real dead body. Do you want to hear a little fun fact? Sure. So during this time that Elmer is hanging in the Laugh in the Dark spook house ride, a young Mark Taylor, who turns out to be later on the uh, creator and designer of He-Man uh, and Skeletor, more mm-hmm. specifically, uh, he was he went to this ride as a young man. He saw Elmer McCurdy's body, thinking that it was just, well, everyone's thinking it's a prop. Mm -hmm. But Mark Taylor recounts later on that when he saw Elmer McCurdy's body, that he knew deep down that that was a real human corpse. He never forgot about it, and he always swore that was a real body hanging in there. He was so affected by it that he based his design of Skeletor off of what he had seen. In the Laugh in the Dark ride. Really? Yes. Skeletor is based on Elmer, Elmer McCurdy. Oh, my God. Body. Exactly. Uh, I don't think Mark Taylor was privy during the 70s when Elmer was discovered to be Elmer McCurdy. It was later on that he just happened to be watching a documentary on the Discovery Channel. Mm-hmm. And I'm talking about a few decades later where they are talking about Elmer McCurdy and his discovery in this Laugh in the Dark amusement ride that was at the Long Beach New Pike or Pike Amusement Park. Mm-hmm. And he went to all his friends. He's like, I knew it. I knew it. I told you. This is crazy. <laughs> but yeah, Skeletor is based on what Mark Taylor saw when he witnessed Elmer McCurdy hanging there in that amusement park. Wow, that might be Elmer's greatest claim to fame. I He's know. Skeletor. So <laughs> Elmer continues to hang here. Finally, in 1976, Universal Studios sends a crew to this funhouse to prepare it for the shooting of an episode of The Six Million Dollar Man. And while they're preparing this uh, location for the shoot, one of the crew members accidentally knocks Elmer's arm off. <laughs> yeah, and this crew member was named Chris Haynes. And uh, once he knocks this arm off, he you know picks it up thinking he's going to reattach it some way. But he notices that it has a strange beef jerky-like texture to it. And beyond <laughs> that, there's a fucking bone sticking out of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Chris Haynes is pretty sure that this is not the paper mache dummy that uh, he had originally thought that it might be. (laughs) He's actually, uh, the guy that that found Elmer McCurdy has actually talked about this, what appears to be only once. So I'm just going to quote and read Chris Haynes' recounting of finding Elmer McCurdy. Okay. Quote, my name is Chris Haynes. I am a teamster in the motion picture industry. On December 7th, I was working on the set dressing crew of the six million dollar man i'm the person who discovered elmer was a person and not paper mache as other members of the crew working in the laugh in the dark attraction thought i noticed elmer had been cut open and crudely stitched back together this is the autopsy uh scars that he's talking about Mm -hmm. i noticed human features that would not be present on a prop or a dummy i was pointing these things out to another crew member as our discussion went on i said if you move his hand away from his private areas You'll see something that's not paper mache. (laughs) So I moved his hand a bit to expose his private parts, and his arm fell off. (laughs) Inside, I could see dried muscle and bone. This definitely was not a dummy. At this time, I went outside of the building and notified the Long Beach, California police officer who was assigned to our production that day that there was a human cadaver in the funhouse. He came in and saw Elmer hanging there. He could see this man was mummified and had been dead for a very long time. And he said, ha, just what Long Beach needs, another dead sailor. And he left. (laughs) 
<laughs> so the cop didn't really care that there's a dead body hanging in here. So to continue with uh, Haynes' quote, I then notified the Long Beach Fire Department's fire safety officer who was on the set. He, too, thought this was funny. And he said, hey, I'm going to call out the paramedics and tell them I have a guy suffering from extreme dehydration. <laughs> <laughs> Continuing again with the quote. It was at this time I had to leave the set to return to the studio and pick up a load for another location. Somehow someone else from the fire department did come to the set and saw Elmer. He notified the Long Beach police who in turn contacted the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office to see if this was indeed a human or a made-up prop. The rest is history. <laughs> so, Chris wow. hey, Haynes contacts two officials who both walk inside and crack jokes and leave. That's L.A. So once word gets out that a genuine dead body has been found in this funhouse, uh, this pretty quickly comes becomes one of those flash-in-the-pan news stories that everybody's talking about for a minute. And by now, when these news stories start coming out and uh, this corpse who has yet to be identified starts getting this notoriety, there's several entities that start trying to get their hands on this corpse. There was an Old West Museum who called, who felt like it would be a good fit for them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Long Beach Amusement Company, who owned uh, this Lab in the Dark funhouse where the body turned up, very kind of quietly inquired if they could have their dead guy back. <laughs> 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 they didn't really want to press that issue too much, though. So they asked, but they didn't really go any farther than that. So the coroner, this medical examiner, originally thought that this might be one of these Mexican cadavers that had been turning up all over the place uh, for medical training. Right. But the body doesn't really fit the bill. I mean, for one thing, it's covered in paint. Usually the... Mexican medical cadavers aren't spray painted. Uh, there's a noose <laughs> around his neck. <laughs> it's pretty clear that uh, the cause of death is not hanging. <laughs> uh, the coroner saw that Y-shaped incision that Chris Haynes had spotted earlier that indicated that this body had been previously autopsied. And the body, of course, was essentially mummified. And they couldn't really open it with a knife. It, the, the skin was too leathery and hard. So they had to use what's called a striker saw, which is what you use to cut the top of somebody's skull off during an autopsy. Right. There's some weird things about this corpse. Uh, the Y-shaped incision that was on the body was of a time that was used in the 1800s and then kind of fell out of favor amongst coroners. When they x-rayed the corpse, the film came back just showing this white blur in the chest cavity, so you couldn't see the internal organs with the x-ray. And this obscuring effect mm -hmm. uh, can be caused by an early embalming technique where they mixed embalming fluid with arsenic, and the arsenic will actually obscure x-rays. Okay, yeah. And that technique with the arsenic kind of stopped being used around the 1930s. Right. So they're starting to kind of close in on how old this corpse is. They found a bullet fragment that they determined began being available in 1905 and was discontinued right after World War II. So now they've got the they've got the time of death of this corpse down to somewhere between 1905 and the early 1940s. So they've chopped up this body, they've cut out all of these mummified organs, they've done all of this sleuthing to narrow this date range down. Uh, it turns out what they should have done was just looked in his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when they after they do all of this stuff and they finally get around to looking in the corpse's mouth, they find uh some nickels <laughs> dated back to 1924 and a ticket stub upon which was printed Lewis Sonny's Museum of Crime, 524 South Main Street, Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> so all you got to do is find. There was so much info in that mouth. Yeah. Yeah. So again, for the second time, Elmer's waiting at a coroner's office for some possible family member to come claim his remains. And for the second time, nobody shows. They did not display him in the lobby this time. <laughs> they left him in the back. After he sits there for a while, a representative from a town called Guthrie, Oklahoma, convinces the coroner's office to release this body to them. They say that Elmer's remains belong in Oklahoma and that they're going to give him a proper burial. What they probably don't say to the to the coroner is that this is probably not going to hurt their tourist industry <laughs> because uh, this this town of Guthrie, Oklahoma, is ridiculous. 
It's a it's a town that has decided to identify itself as this old west kind of replica town. Yeah. Not really a replica town, but uh well, I'll say this. They do uh every Saturday they have old west gun battles on the main street and down. Really? Yes. And they have also accumulated several Old West outlaws to bury in their town. So on April 22nd, 1977, the good folks of Guthrie, Oklahoma, held a funeral service for Elmer McCurdy. About 300 people attended and watched Elmer getting lowered into the ground next to and among other dead outlaws that the Old West-themed town had acquired previously. Out of an abundance of of caution and fears that somebody might someday try to resurrect Elmer for another stint on the trail, the coffin's descent into the ground was immediately followed by a flow of concrete that would soon dry to the thickness of two feet. From that day on, one of America's most well-traveled and shamelessly desecrated corpses has rested in a beautiful open space named Boot Hill in Guthrie, Oklahoma's Summit View Cemetery. Thank you so much for listening to episode nine of Where is the Line? If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a review like these fine folks did. We've got some new friends from down under. Oi. <laughs> what are other Australian phrases? Crikey. Crikey. <laughs> Natasha says, five stars, your newest fan from down under. Totally freaking meow with a cat emoji. Oh. I very much recommend Where is the Line? The content is super disturbing, but the hosts do a fab job. Natasha needs to be watching her mailbox because she's got a very special package coming from Where is the Line? It's a bomb. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, it's not a bomb. It's not a snowball bomb. <laughs> Watch your mailbox, though. We have another review from Susan Andrews Ferris. You don't say. Yeah, you know who that is? Yes, I do. I love that woman. That is my mother. She is your mother. She made you. <laughs> Susan writes... Very well done. Kevin puts a lot of time into this, and it pays off. Inexplicably included with my mother's review was a photo of what I believe is her fingernails. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what was behind that, but I told you her nails looked fierce. Mom's nails are legit. Yeah. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the podcast because these episodes do not come out on any particular schedule. Again, thank you all so much for listening. We'll see you again soon. Goodbye. Kids, when you go to bed, stay away from your closets and don't look under your